Welcome back. This is Michael Mergens with the Armorer Store, and this segment is on the inspection, maintenance, and repair of foils. So before we start on the actual how does it work and the inspection and maintenance and repair, I just want to talk basically about the fundamental parts of any weapon. They consist of a point, the blade, a guard, the grip, and then what's on the inside we call the pommel nut. My last job in the Army was a director of all the Army aviation programs and I had responsibility for oversight and which you know most of the, those systems are helicopters. Helicopters have something similar to a pommel nut. It's called the Jesus nut. It's what holds the rotors onto the helicopter. The pommel nut is basically the same thing. It's what holds the entire weapon together. There are several styles of pommel nut. There is what we call the outside hex, which is nothing more than a hexagonal piece of metal with a hole drilled and tapped down through the center. And for those that are keeping track, this is a six millimeter by one thread. There are some out there, not, they're very rare these days, that were 1224. They were manufactured by uh, non-European manufacturers. But as I said, those are very, very rare these days. The other is called an inside hex, and it takes an Allen key that is six millimeters that is used to screw from the inside. Each one of these has several advantages. The outside hex, by using a 10 millimeter socket, will fit down over and does not worry about how long the tang or the threaded portion of the blade is. You can thread it down and not have any problems. The problem with these though is that they can bind against the inside of the grip. The inside hex fits in and is very good. You get good contact. You don't have to worry about it binding. The problem with the inside hex is that if the tang is too long it can, as you tighten it, push the key out and leave you with no way to loosen after you're finished. The other method takes a pommel nut and a large flat tip screwdriver because it has a slot that is cut in it. This has the same issues as the inside pommel because if you've cut the tang too long as you screw it down it will back it out. The other problem is, is because of the amount of force that you can put on that pommel nut, you can separate the nut and it will eventually break. One of the key things to remember about any of your equipment, foils, epes, or sabers, is that if you have multiple, make sure that you have the same style of equipment on all of them. What that does is simplifies what you need to take with you when you go to a tournament or when you're working on your own equipment. I personally like the outside hex because of the reasons we discussed previously about the tang length. The other thing is, is that make sure that your tips are all the same. Now there are three basic styles of tips. There is the French variety, which has a collar in it that is threaded. It has a 1.7 millimeter screw that goes into it that is flanged. It goes into the barrel. And we'll talk about the makeup of a point later and why that's important. The next style is the German style. The German tip has a collar on it where the screw will come in and contact the collar and allow it to come up and down. Again, we'll talk about how points work in a moment. Finally, we have what's called the collarless tip. These screws will come in a certain distance and contact what's called the flange, this small piece on the end, directly and it has no moving part. 
The reason why I say that you need to make sure that your tips are all the same or all your equipment is the same is that when you go to put in screws, there are three different styles of screws and they're not interchangeable. So make sure that you have the right screw for the right job. In inspecting a foil, one of the things that you want to check for is, first of all, the bend in the blade. The bend in this is pretty excessive, but it has to be continuous in one line. You don't want it to go down and then come back up. Again, this is a safety issue. The reason for the bend in the, bl in the blade is because that now makes the blade act as a shock absorber. As you hit, it will bend in one direction. You want it to bend upward like this when you hit. Again, coaches, this is something you need to emphasize to your students is that when they, when they hit, the blade needs to go up, not go down. The reason for that is if that blade should break, the force is going to take it up and away from your opponent and, not, and lessen the chance that they'll get stabbed with the broken end of the blade. If you have an S-bend in, in the blade to cause it like this, when you hit, it will double the stress on the blade and also cause it to go downward and into your opponent if it breaks. Make sure that you have a smooth, continuous curve in your weapon. This particular weapon has an excessive bend in it. It is too far. The distance, the vertical distance between the guard and the tip should be no more than one centimeter. The way you measure this is you place the weapon on a table with the guard and the point, and you take a block that is one centimeter high, and it should not pass underneath the blade. There are several ways to take this excessive bend out of the blade. You can put it under your foot and rub it back and forth. You can try to bend it with your hand. But the method I prefer is to take a crescent wrench with a loop in the end. You slide it over the blade to the point where you want to make the bend and you squeeze the crescent wrench between the blade and your hand and you work it back and forth to take out the excessive bend. This is also good for fixing if you have an S-bend to do the same thing. This blade is much straighter and now we'll pass our test. The other thing you want to look for is the condition of the tape that is on the end of the foil. The reason why we have tape here is that when fencing, if you make contact between the blade and the lame, it could give you a block point and not go off. Therefore, what you want to do is make sure that this is in good shape at all times. The distance of tape that you need from the bottom of the barrel to the bottom of the tape is 15 centimeters. A good tool to use to measure that is standard US currency, which is six inches, which is approximately 15 centimeters. For this particular weapon, since we measure it to the bottom, we're just at 15 centimeters. Now I will say that this tape does need to be replaced and we will do that later. The other thing that you want to check to make sure is that the barrel is tight and that when you have a connection, which this particular weapon does not at this point and we'll be taking it apart and putting it together later, you want to make sure that the wire is connected to the socket. There are two basic styles of sockets that are in use today. It's called the two prong, which if you saw our video on body cords will understand that this is standard for foil and for saber it has a four millimeter fat pin and a three millimeter thin pin. 
that goes to the two wires that connect the weapon. The thin line is always connected to the B line. And we'll talk about the importance of the, of the B line later. The fat one goes to the C line, which is also known as the ground. If you look at a two-prong connector, you will see that there is a insulator on the thin socket and that there is no insulator on the C line or the fat socket. That's because the electricity will flow through the C line, through the socket, to the weapon. The other style is called a bayonet style. A bayonet style simply affixes much like a bayonet on an old weapon. You push it in and you twist it. This also has a built-in mechanism for retention okay, and is the alternate style. There are variations on this. Uh, there is a one that has a prongs on it that is an, uh, an Italian style. Uh, there have been several others, but today the bayonet and the two prong are the two styles that are predominantly used in fencing. In order to test your weapon, you need to have either a small LED light box or a full ohmmeter box. You need a body cord. In this case, I have a body cord that has several connectors on the end of it that I use. This particular weapon is hooked up to my machine. If I take it and put it on the test box, I should get a continuous light, red light, showing on the test box. When you depress the tip, the light goes out. You release the tip, the light goes back on. We know now the weapon is basically functioning correctly. The next thing you want to test is to make sure that the spring that's inside the point is of the proper weight. And for that, you need a 500 gram weight, plus or minus 2 grams. You place it over the top of the weapon. You pull down slightly and release it. When you pull down, the light should go off. When you release it, the light should go back on. If the light does not go back on, then you need to replace the spring. That is the basic inspections of the, of the weapons. The other things that you want to make sure of is that, as in this particular case, there is a separation between the reinforcing plate and the guard. That will cause a weapon to fail because that is a point or a place where a point can get caught and cause a blade to break. So therefore, this, this particular guard is, is not good and should either be repaired or replaced. And we'll talk about repairing it here in a minute. As we said, this weapon does not have a socket, therefore we're going to go put one on. What you'll need to work on this are several things. You'll need your pommel tool. You'll need an 8 millimeter ratcheting wrench, which you can get at any box, large box uh, home improvement store. You will need a special tool. Now this is a tool that I have designed and made, which I have ground down the point to three millimeters, which will end up, which will fit inside the socket and not cause the blade or the screwdriver to fall off. So this is a good use for all those little short stubby screwdrivers that you always get within your uh, screwdriver sets that you buy and you really don't know what to do with. So we place the foil in the vise, tip down, and we un unloosen the pommel nut. Inside the grip, you will have your nut 
and you should also have a lock washer on the inside. The lock washer provides force back against the pommel nut and the grip to keep it from coming loose. Many people will take and put multiple lock washers inside of a grip thinking that they're going to get either more uh, grip or tightness or to extend the pommel nut up. That is counterproductive. You need only one lock washer. If you want to increase the distance by putting washers in, then you need to use flat washers, not lock washers. I always keep the lock washer and the nut inside the grip so they don't go anywhere. You pull off the thumb pad and this wire, I will go ahead and remove the guard at this point because I'm going to show you here in a second how to fix this. But you have a single wire that runs through a piece of insulation called the spaghetti. So what you need to work with this is you're going to need your wire strippers which you will come in and you'll take off a portion of that spaghetti exposing the wire. Now most wires come with a coating of varnish on them and also a piece of cotton uh, insulation wrap that goes over it. What you need to do next is take a lighter and burn that varnish off of the wire. A common mistake when people put weapons together is they fail to take that varnish off. They get it all together, they put it on their box, they go to test it, and nothing works because you're not making the connection. So go ahead and burn that off and you can scrape it off either with a knife or your fingernails because the residue that's left behind is carbon which is also conductive. I'm going to digress here for a minute. We're going to talk about the guard and repairing it. Basically what you need to do this with is a small ball peen hammer. and a flat iron surface, metal surface, like the edge of this vise. And what you want to do is just beat that back. This is also the method that you use for when these rivets come loose. So a few quick taps and we're back flush in a safe condition. We replace the guard onto the blade, ensuring that the small cutouts that are in the side, the, the uh, middle of the guard, go over the wires. And you slide that over it and lay it down. The next thing you do is you want to take your connector and again, setting it up for either right-handed or left-handed, you take the connector and you slide it over the guard or the, the tang and lay it flat. Here is another common mistake. People will take the thumb pad and they'll put it on first and then they'll put the connector on. What that does is that now breaks the circuit between the guard, the ground, and the blade. Make sure that it goes under the thumb pad. So you place it under the thumb pad, take your grip, it has a notch in it, the notch should go, the wire should pass through the notch so you don't crimp it, and then you reattach the pommel nut and the washer. Now, sometimes what will happen is, is that when you put on the washer, it gets caught sideways and you have a tough time dropping it in to the, into the socket. What I do is I will take a screwdriver, a small screwdriver, put the washer over it, hold it on, put the tip of the screwdriver on the end of the tang and release it and it will cause it to fall straight into the slot. Now that we have that assembled and put together,
we want to attach the wire. On most foil sockets, they have a small hole that you want to slide the wire up through and then around the wire. Now, when you're attaching wires, it's important to remember which way you attach them. If, because righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, if we're going to tighten this up, we're going to spin it this way. If I put the wire on the opposite side and I tighten it, it's going to want to take the wire out. So you want to make sure that when you put the wire around, it goes up and so that when you tighten it, it forces it back down. Let's open this up a little bit. A handy tool for when you're putting wires on are a pair of hemostats. If you've been to the emergency room as many times as I have over the course of my life, you probably have a few of these around because they tend to give them away because they don't want to sterilize them. Uh, or you can find them at most uh, some fabric stores, hobby shops, etc., places where they do beading. Grab a hold of the wire, slide it between the socket and the insulator, or if there is a if there is a washer present, make sure you get it between the washer and the socket, not between the washer and the in insulator. Reason being is because that the uh, washer will tend to drag the wire with it as you go. Take your specialty tool and your 8 millimeter ratchet. Take your ratchet, put it up underneath. Take your specialty tool, you can tighten it down this way. And you can hold it in place and tighten it. and you've assembled your weapon. A note, pistol grips are not the only style used. There is also called the French grip, which is a longer grip and has a large nut that, fu that goes on the end of it. Some are brass, some are hexagonal shaped. If you have a hexagonal shaped one, if you have one of your dad's old spark plug wrenches, that fits very nicely over the top and you can use a ratchet to tighten it down. We have our weapon put together, take it out, connect it up, and on the meter I'm getting one ohm, and when I depress it, it comes back, so that means the weapon is working. Go to check the test, this tip again, pull it down, and it hesitates a little bit before it returns to where it's supposed to be or it's stuck. So that means that we need to go inside the tip. So in order to work on the tip you're going to need several several items. First of all remember our roll of masking tape. It's a very important piece. Place it on the table because most things in fencing are round. And what do round things like to do? They like to roll. Therefore if you take a piece of a roll of tape and put the guard in it it will keep the blade in one spot and won't roll around the table. The other thing that you will need, is you will generally find these, especially if you're young and have order out for a lot of pizza, it is a common kitchen magnet. This one happens to, happen to have my business card on the other side, but this is the primary tool, the first armoring tool that I give away. The reason why we have the magnet is because, again, round things like to do what? They like to roll. We place it under the tip. We remove the tape, and as we said earlier, this tape needs to be replaced, and it can be either taken off with a thumbnail or remove it with a knife. Be careful when you're cutting because You want to make sure that you control the blade as you're cutting and you don't want to cut yourself. So remove the, the insulation from around the tip.
one of the things that I would like to do and then I'll do after we finish working on the tip is clean this up a little bit before we retape we retape it next thing you will need is a jeweler screwdriver or a small screwdriver and your parts I keep mine in a small box that I bought from one of the hobby stores for five dollars if you look in the beading section of these stores you can generally find containers like this as you can see I also have these round objects which are buckyballs unfortunately you can't buy them on the open market these days as they're a health hazard but they're rare earth magnets if you put several inside you can uh, store them here and it's also a handy place for keeping your jeweler's screwdriver I keep one attached to my screwdriver so that when I'm removing screws and whatnot the screws stay on the magnet so let's go ahead and work on this you roll it around and remove the screw or attempt to remove the screw again make sure that you don't have your fingers in the way when you're trying to do this because these screwdrivers are very thin and they can be very sharp sometimes they want to come out easily sometimes they don't so the first one is out and the second one as you're doing this again you want to keep your fingers away from it as much as possible but you don't want to keep it too far away as you get out because you want to make sure that that spring that's inside doesn't take your tip and shoot it across the room uh, this is a good point to point out the corollary to Murphy's Law. Everybody knows Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will. The corollary is, is that any tool dropped or any part dropped will roll to the most inaccessible part of the garage. So keep your, keep your thumb on the tip. Remove the tip. Take your spring and then remove the spring from the inside. Okay. The tip that we've removed is a German tip. Again, has the collar and the fully threaded screws that go in and contact the collar. An issue with these particular tips is the fact that these walls in the barrel are very, very thin. Uh, sometimes they get knocked out of shape and that's what causes the, uh, the uh, tip not to move smoothly. To fix that, you have two, two particular ways of doing that. One is called a mandrel which is a hardened piece of steel that is the same diameter that fits down inside of, of the barrel that you sometimes you'll have to tap it in in order to get it out. When you do that, when you remove it, you remove it with a crescent wrench, make sure that you remove it in this direction because if it's stuck and you do it this way, you end up unscrewing the barrel off and you break the wire and that will lead us to the rewiring section which will be another video. The other way to do that is to use a 4.5 millimeter reamer. Uh, these are available from tool shops like McMaster Carr, Granger, uh, Northwestern Tools. You can go online and just look for a 4.5 millimeter reamer and you take that and you put it inside the tip and you it, since it cuts in one direction you just spin it and get it cleaned out. Once you do that, make sure that you take a Q-tip. Uh, you can soak this in contact cleaner if you wish, I don't recommend it, or 91% uh, rubbing alcohol. Not 60, not 70, but 91. The reason being is because it is the extra uh, elements that are in it are water and that will tend to stay in and corrode. But you take your Q-tip and run it inside to clean out any, any gunk and stuff that may be on the inside of it. The next thing is to take a piece of small copper tubing that you can put inside and it fits over the little copper piece on the inside called the cap and you can take it and spin it and it will help clean the corrosion from where the spring contacts the wire. 
Once we have that all cleaned out, we take our bad spring, we throw it away, and we get a new one. Again, I have my parts segregated as to German, French, Epe, and foil. Put your new spring in. Now comes the most difficult part of putting a foil and an Epe back together, and that is the springs, or correction, the screws. I put my screw on the end of my screwdriver, and I tend to hold it in place with my forefinger. So I get this in place, start threading it. Now, sometimes, if you're not careful, you can cross-thread these. A good technique that was shown to me by Mr. Dan DeShane was that if you take the screw and you run it backwards, you can feel it click, and that is the ends of the threads engaging each other. Once you get to that point, then tighten down the screw, flip the weapon over, get the next screw, Again, being careful to put it in place. Go backwards and feel it click. And then screw it down. Okay, now this particular screw does not want to cooperate very well. So I'm going to replace it. Don't be afraid to replace screws, uh, they get rusty, they're not that expensive, but the thing that you need, again, to make sure is that you use German screws with German tips. Now, I will make one point, and it will be difficult to illustrate this here, but you need to, when you have a German screw, the top of the screw is slightly rounded. Um, there are other ones out there. Uh, the English style has a, uh, and when we get to Epe, we'll talk to those a little bit about the flat-headed ones. But foil sc German screws tend to have a round head on the top. Okay, we have that in. It's connected, it's working and it's not sticking. All right, so good. We have this now repaired. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and tape the, um, the end. Uh, normally I will take a piece of like one inch uh, gaff tape uh, or other tip tape. You pull it apart. I always start with the blade. There are sanding blocks that are available from many of the vendors and whatnot that you can use to just rub down the blade and remove the corrosion. When we talk about how foils work, we're going to talk about why it is important that you don't have corrosion on your blade or the guard. So we clean that off. We put our weapon back in the in the vise tip up and we take the tape and we lay it along the side of the blade away that's away from where the groove is and the wire is and we lay it up against that making sure that it covers the bottom of the barrel but not the screws and I'll cover why you do that here in a minute so and then just work it around the blade. Until you have a nice smooth covering down the blade. Next you take a piece that's about, oh I'd say an inch long or so. And you wrap it around just below the top of the barrel. 
and you wrap it around. Now, the reason why we put this on last is because if you have to get to change your spring, you don't want to have to retape it every single time. All you have to do is remove this top piece of tape and you have access to your screws and you can get into your tip. If you discover that after you put this together at some point you have a loose barrel, you can pull this down, pull it apart. For foil, you need a five millimeter wrench to pace around the collar at the bottom. There's two, generally there are two flats on the bottom of the, of the barrel and you can tighten, tighten the barrel. You don't want to go too far because there's a plastic cap in the inside that is connected to the wire. If you twist it too far, you can end up twisting that cap right off the wire and breaking the wire. So if, it's, if you're going more than a couple turns, and again, you want to get this down close enough to hold the blade, and you make sure that it's snug up tight. If when you're tightening this barrel, either tightening it because it's become loose or you're doing an assembly, and you hear a loud ting, you have just split the barrel and you need to put in a new one. So, that completes the assembly of the foil. Let's talk about how it works. The foil has a tip in it that is what we call a normally closed circuit. In other words, when you're hooked up to the machine, there is a small amount of current that flows from the B line along the wire up to the tip. It is through the copper cap and the spring that now presses down against the bottom of the tip, which is that little flange piece that we talked about before. When the spring is holding it up against the collar, it completes the circuit to the barrel and then the blade and then back to the sea line or the ground. Any break in that circuit will cause the machine to register a white light. It's an instantaneous break. So if you're fencing and all of a sudden you make a move or motion or something and you get a white light, that means something is loose somewhere. Okay. If it goes continuous white, bright, white light, that means that there is a break in that circuit at some point. When you depress the tip against your opponent's off target, you get the white light. As we said before, the electricity is flowing from the B down through the ground. Let me explain something about electricity, and I like to use water as an analogy. Water will always flow to the lowest point. Electricity is the same way. It will go from what we call the highest potential or the vol highest voltage state, in this case 12 volts, down to zero. We will always want to do that and electricity will always seek to go to the lowest state just like water will always seek to go to the lowest point. If you contact your opponent's weapon that is also connected to that zero state, it looks at it and it goes, okay, so nothing has changed. I've got contact with the ground, I'm happy. That's why it doesn't go off when you hit your opponent's weapon, because it's connected to the ground. If you break the circuit, it has nowhere to go, and that's where the light starts to go off white. The reason for the A-line and the clip on a foil body cord is that when you contact your opponent's lame, the electricity flows from the point through the lame, through the A-line and that completes a circuit. The electricity is now happy, it's just going a different direction. It hasn't gone to ground yet, but it goes through a different circuit that turns on the colored light. So, if you have a white light, first of all, you want to check the connections, make sure they're working. In our previous video, we talked about body cords. 99% of the problems are body cords. It's the body cord stupid. If you have a white light to check, Take your two-prong 
and short against the guard. If the white light goes off, then that means it's the weapon. If it does not, then it means it could be either the weapon or the body cord or both. If you hit your opponent and you get a white light, check first for dead spots on the LeMay, but then go back and press against the clip itself. If the light goes off, then it's the LeMay. If it does not go off, it's either the LeMay or the body cord. The referee at this point should be going ahead and checking back through the rest of the system, through the real floor cord and back to the machine to make sure that that's working. <laughs> Thank you.